Welcome to class eight. And in this class, we're going to discuss corporate governance in the framework of small businesses, private businesses, and um, small organizations outside of the corporate structures, um, NGOs in particular. Now, while we do have a syllabus that we follow in this regard, this is a particularly important time for these small businesses and NGOs, given the COVID environment that's happening. So as I go through the lecture notes, try and think about the practical aspect of these, um, how these businesses are faring in this very challenging environment. And you'll be able to relate, particularly around sustainability for these smaller businesses and the risks that they might face, and also how good corporate governance practices might be able to assist businesses like this in remaining sustainable through challenging times. Let's have a look at the nature of a small business. This will typically be a PTY Limited, which is a company formed under the Companies Act and is covered by the Companies Act and must comply with the Companies Act. A CC or a Closed Corporation, which is incorporated in terms of the Closed Corporations Act. There's no new CCs um, being formed, but you can buy into the membership of an existing CC. And then partnerships and sole proprietorships. These are unincorporated entities, uh, manner in which to do business that doesn't have a formal structure. There's no legal juristic personality to uh, a partnership or to a sole proprietorship like you would find in a company or in a CC. Typically, smaller businesses are not responsible to the public as shareholders. So in a public company where the shares can be freely traded between shareholders in, in a smaller entity, there, there are those restrictions on trading shares. So there isn't that responsibility to shareholders. But these companies will still have a network of stakeholders that rely on on the sustainability of small businesses, particularly suppliers. So if you have a, a company that produces a food-based product that it then sells onto restaurants, now under COVID, that um, stakeholder relationship is going to be very strained and challenging for the next few weeks. Small businesses also have a more intimate relationship between shareholders and management. So that shareholder versus the directors or the executives who are looking after the entity on behalf of the shareholders. Quite often they are the same people as well. So you will have a shareholder who is also the manager or the director of, of a small business. They will have less regulatory requirements on them. So naturally, these are not companies that are listed on the JSC. They won't be falling under financial service providers and that very onerous legislation that goes along with those. But under King 3, applied to all organizations, including small businesses. But as you will remember, those 76 requirements of King 3 were quite onerous and hard for companies, smaller companies, to comply with. King 4 applies to all organizations, but because it has only 16 principles, it's so much easier to meet with those requirements. As soon as the business grows and it starts becoming susceptible or at least um, has to comply with more compliance requirements, so there will be an increased risk and an increased cost to that business. Compliance is quite an expensive thing um, you, to, to do. The, the compliance requirements in certain legislation will require capital adequacy requirements where a certain amount of money has to be ring-fenced and um, kept separate from trading capital, which takes capital out of the business. And that means that those businesses need to be a fair size before they can start operating in those very um, compliance-driven environments. However, small businesses will naturally have a risk of conflict of interest, particularly where you have the same person fulfilling the role of director, shareholder, and an employee of the company. So one person running their own business 
may take money out of the business to pay himself or herself for the, the work that's done. And they may blur those lines between the shareholder role and, and the management role and what the responsibilities are as, as an employee of the company. That could be perfectly all right if it's just one person on their own with a very small stakeholder group. But as that gets bigger and there's more stakeholders involved, that risk of how those conflicts of interest are managed can become more salient. To the extent that you might have a very big business still operating as a PTY Limited, which is fine, but where you've got a shareholder who's also a director and still controls the bank accounts for that business, you will have a problem with conflict of interest, particularly if that person is withdrawing money from that company's account on the auspices of being the shareholder. Remember that those assets in that bank account belong to the company and not to the shareholder, regardless of whether it's the same person as the, as the director or the employee. So it's very important in a small business to make sure that the role and responsibilities of the management and the shareholders are clearly defined and communicated and everybody understands their place in this little environment. Also, smaller businesses are often family-based, which means that you've got family members interacting with each other. There are pros and cons to that, but with, the, with regard to the cons, there's a famous saying that you can pick your friends, but you can't pick your family. So arguments amongst family members can actually damage the sustainability of a business. The UN Economic Commission in Europe recognized how many small businesses they, they, they were operating in the, in the Euro European economy. And they brought out an academic paper on, on small businesses at recognizing that good governance is an important element for economic growth. So these companies should be well governed if, if they are to grow in part of the economy. Good governance in an SME, a small to medium enterprise, means that a successful business can contribute to the overall economic growth of a country. Particularly significant in developing countries with high unemployment rates, SMEs create jobs and support a large base of stakeholders. In South Africa, our biggest sector of employment is created through the SME environment. And that's the environment that has been so negatively impacted by COVID. And we can expect to see that the unemployment levels are going to increase as a result of that negative implications. Let's reflect on the dangers of poor corporate governance. Poor strategic development. Even if a company is small, strategic development is just as important as it would be in a large company. Small companies have the benefit of being quite agile and they can adapt to changing circumstances quite quickly. Larger companies, it's a large ship you've got to turn if you want to do anything differently. So smaller companies can have that advantage. But on the downside, they have less resources and they have less access to funding and they have an increased level of risk, meaning that they are more risk averse. They depend on resources. Um, the loss of a key resource could cripple the business. So if you have a, a sole proprietorship, the death of that, the, the person running that business will literally come, that business will come to an end. Um, small um, SMEs that are operating now in South Africa under the COVID regime have, where they have lost any component of their business, it has, it can have a terminal effect on the sustainability of that business. There can also be disputes between owners of businesses. Where you have a larger company with a lot of shareholders, they may have things in common, interests in common, and um, they, they, are, they are there for, for that distribution and that increased wealth. But where in a small environment you have these close-knit shareholders, you have a lot more interaction on a personal basis. So your engagement is less regulated. If, you, if it's a small business, it's not run through the company's act. 
you have even less regulation if it's just a partnership. Then the partners have just agreed themselves how they're going to operate. If you're in a company environment, a shareholders agreement between shareholders is a very useful tool to have to manage those relationships between the owners of the company. And the shareholders can obviously replace reliance on the board and the MOI in order to give them guidance on how disputes might be managed. They may, may, maintains this need though for the clarity between the roles of directors and as distinct from their powers as shareholders. Even if it's a small business, that person running that business needs to keep in their minds that distinction between being a director and being a shareholder. If there are disputes, there are avenues through which um, smaller businesses can use to resolve those disputes without going an expensive legal process, such as alternate dispute resolution, which involves arbitration and mediation. But um, by the time we get to a point where our, our owners are in a dispute in a small business, that in itself can, can be quite detrimental to the sustainability of the business. Small businesses typically have limited access to capital, capital being funds of money. If they do access money, it will generally be through a personal loan that that shareholder or director has got for the business, um, and they probably got it through pledging a personal asset such as a house. Banks don't typically make large funds available to smaller businesses because they don't have that asset value that can stand as surety ship or security against that capital that's being lent. So because they have a small balance sheet, they don't have that access to that funding. They also have pressure on cash flows. So the money that comes in from selling a product immediately needs to be used to buy more product in order to to continue the, the business cycle. There's very little money to invest into savings or into reserves that, that, get, that can be there to fall back on in hard times. There's also a tendency to have less um, stringent or, or formalized financial reporting. And that can be quite difficult to maintain accurate records that are complete and up-to-date as one would expect to find in a larger business. Smaller businesses have a limitation on skills, um, reliance on that director shareholder relationship. So, for example, a plumbing business that has one or two people in it, or maybe even a few more, they're probably excellent plumbers and they probably do a really, really good job on the service that they, they render, but they may very well be terrible bookkeepers and they may not necessarily have the funds to hire a, a, a decent bookkeeper um, and get that financial reporting as a, they may not even think of financial reporting as being a business tool that they can use to improve their business. The financial information that comes out of these businesses can be reviewed rather than audited, but it would be preferable if it was audited. We'll, we'll discuss the public interest scores um, a little bit later on, but as you will remember, if a business has a public interest score of more than 350, then it does need to be audited its, its annual financial statements rather than simply reviewed. And that the more review and independence that is involved in a um, financial report means that there has more reliability to third parties. So it's definitely preferable if these, these financials can be audited. King 4 makes the recommendation that where you do have financial statements that are reviewed, even if they don't need to be audited, you should have some degree of independent oversight. Even when you don't need to have an audit committee, there should be a degree of independent oversight in place over those financials to give that reliability and assurance. The lack of management skills in smaller businesses, it can also be a deterrence to, to sustainable strategic goals. It can be difficult for a small business to objectively determine what management skills 
it, it requires in order to deliver its strategy. Can, can the management skills that it has available actually deliver the strategy? Typically a board would be the place where that would be considered. But in a smaller entity where there is no board or it's a, it's, it's a smaller board, one has to think about whether or not there's sufficient um, interrogation as to the skills levels with regards to delivering the strategy. There may also be a limited ability to address risks in the business, again because of that limited access to skills. And there would be reduced succession planning and a lot of key person risk. So everything is invested in one or, or a few directors who may also be shareholders of the company. And this key person risk can also translate into key person dominance. So where you have one character in a business, a small business that is very, very powerful, and there's no board or anyone else to really counter that. So in a family business, you know, typically your father, the patriarch, who rules the family business and his decision is final. There's limited access to independence uh, for smaller businesses. So, um, we have, low, we have a lower level of non-executive directors who may participate in smaller businesses. And when there are non-executive directors in these smaller businesses, you may find that they are actually just friends of the owner or shareholder director. And therefore, they don't really have an awful lot of independence. They have a limited ability to influence decisions. It's still, they're still mates. They still get together and have brides together. Their kids plays to play together. So there isn't that ability for the independent non-executive to really have a vigorous, unfettered contribution to how the business is run. There can also be a lot of perceptions around nepotism, particularly in a family business. Family businesses that are successful have this mantra of wanting to be, uh, have a legacy for the family and create that legacy, which gets handed down from one generation to another. And that, that's perfectly fine. But the downside of it is that in, in employing family members simply because they are family members and then placing them into senior positions ahead of other staff members who may be more qualified or experienced weakens the management team in that business. There may also be an unfair application of remuneration that is skewed in favor of family members. So they take the bulk of the money in terms of salary that would not be applied in that proportion if they were not family members. There can also be a perception amongst non-family members around limited potential for growth. So, i.e. a glass ceiling is automatically in place for anyone who is not a member of the family. For example, um, a person may simply never be able to become a director because they are not a family member. And that may limit their career growth. So they may be a very good employee, but they will leave the company because they know that they're just never going to be able to fulfill their own personal career aspirations. Smaller businesses typically have informal internal financial controls. From the time at which a business might have been a sole proprietor, where it was a person who worked simply for herself or himself, and what money they made, they then used that to live off. So a subsistence business, if you will. And that would be fine because it was just one person. But as the company might grow, so more stakeholders are involved. And those internal financial controls need to be stricter and to grow with the business. And quite often, a business can grow quite quickly, but the internal financial controls do not grow along with the business. So you could have a multi-million rand entity where you still have a shareholder accessing the company's bank accounts to take funds out for his or her personal use. That limited adherence to financial controls and limited independence, independent oversight can have that negative impact on the company's ability to remain sustainable, particularly in risky situations like COVID. It also can result in breaches of the Companies Act. 
many of these entities that started off as sole proprietorships and then become formalized as companies, those shareholder directors don't ever really build a threshold where they say, okay, from now on, we have to apply the solvency and liquidity test in order to make a distribution. So I cannot take money out of this company's bank account unless the board has applied the solvency and liquidity test. It's very unusual to actually find that in play and being used properly in small companies, even though they are operating under the Companies Act. And I see it frequently, even in companies in which we invest, and I have to give this education and director training to these uh, directors of these smaller businesses that, that we've acquired, and you explain the solvency and liquidity test to them, and they look at you with a blank expression, and they have literally never even heard of it. And it's not that they're malicious or greedy or have any ill intention. It was simply that becoming a company and operating under the Companies Act, they never even knew that this was something they needed to do. Then again, the other thing that happens is the, the easy access to company resources, particularly through credit cards, and if it's a cash business as well. It's very easy to get hold of a, a to use cash out of the till or to swipe a company credit card for personal use. And that, as you will remember from previous lectures on the solvency and liquidity test, constitutes financial assistance under Section 45 of the Companies Act. Because it is a smaller management team and because the shareholder director relationship is so close, there is limited oversight or ability to challenge that financial control. And think back to how relevant then that King 4 recommendation is that companies have some independent oversight over those financials, even if they are not required to have an audit committee. Smaller companies can also fail to appreciate the importance of external sh stakeholders to the business. They tend to be quite internally focused and only focused on their immediate market, which means that they can have, um, there's a danger of them developing relationships with suppliers and customers that are conflicting and may be anti-competitive um, and may not comply with the Companies Act, there may also be a lot of opportunity for price fixing and collusion. They can also become over dependent on key suppliers and key customers. It's not unheard of for a small business to have only one or two large customers. And if that customer were to go out of business for whatever reason, the entire small business would then collapse as a result. Let's have a look at remuneration in small businesses. You'll remember that principle 14 of King 4 deals with remuneration and it says that the board should ensure that the company remunerates fairly, responsibly and transparently so as to promote the achievement of strategic objectives and promote and positive outcomes in the short, medium and long term. Fair remuneration is an ethical matter. And it relates to impartiality, rational, rationality in rational decision making, and addressing issues of inequality. So I'm just going to hover on this for a moment. Fair remuneration has to have an element of impartiality. It doesn't matter whether you are male or female. If you are doing exactly the same job, you should be paid exactly the same amount. It should be rational in the basis that it should have a connection. The amount of money should be connected to the job that is delivered um, and that should have a rational connection. So you obviously can't earn a huge amount of money for doing a very menial task. There should be a, a rationality in, in that level of remuneration and, and how those decisions are processed. However, Given the society in which we live in, we have, depending on the time at which a study is done, between the first and the third biggest income differentiator, differential, I beg your pardon, in the world. So we have the biggest gap between our highest earning and our lowest earning members of society. 
we're one of three in the in, in largest in, with that gap in the world. So that is really quite a substantial gap that we need to bridge. So when you consider what is fair remuneration, you also need to take into account how you address those issues of inequality that exist. And a good example of that would be to say, for a business to say, I'm going to give my staff a 5% annual increase this year. I'm going to take 5% of my budget and I'm going to apply that to annual salary increases. But instead of giving everybody the same 5%, I'm going to do it on a gradiated scale. So for the, the highest earners, they will get a 2% increase and the lowest earners may get a 7 or an 8% increase. Now that is not an unfair or unethical activity. That's not impart, um, exercising part, partiality. That is a fair remuneration practice which would address issues of inequality that exist. And you do see a lot of businesses starting to do that. And I think after COVID, um, we, we hopefully will see those, those massive salary decreases that some of our executives have taken, maybe translating into the income um, and an increased income in our lower sectors of society. Essentially, responsible remuneration is an economic matter. The business is going to pay money over to a staff member and the staff member is going to use that money to buy food and pay rent and that money is going to go back into the economy. But on a smaller scale in the, in the concept of our or in the framework of our little businesses which we're talking about, all remuneration needs to, to be cognizant of the sustainability of the business. If the business doesn't exist anymore, it can't continue to pay salaries. In order for it to be considered responsible, it needs to have some sort of approval by an appropriate authority. And what that means is that when we pay, decide what salary we're going to pay people in our staff, we need to make sure that it's signed off properly, that one person is not determining his or her own salary, that there is an independent element to how that salary is de determined. The smaller the business, the more difficult that is going to be, but one would hope that that shareholder director in a small business would have that view around maintaining the sustainability and would not be grabbing money out of the business for, for their own remuneration that would not continue to support that sustainability. Remuneration also needs to be done in a manner that will ensure the creation of value and positive outcomes for that business. So the business needs to continue to um, grow and develop and achieve its strategic outcomes. So we need to make sure that the people who are employed by the business who are creating this value and delivering the strategy, that they're actually paid in a reasonable way. There is a lot of benefit to having some degree of independence, even in a small business that overlooks remuneration. Where you've got a family business and people are haggling with each other about how much they should take as a salary, an independent element can, can resolve those disagreements particularly in smaller boards. However, that independent element must be truly independent and able to act without fetter. Non-executive directors in a small business. There's no legislative or regulatory duty on a small business to appoint a non-executive director. So you'll remember that the Companies Act only starts differentiating in exec between executive and non-executive directors when it comes to the audit committee and how that audit committee is constituted and that audit committee has to be a public company or um, a, a state-owned company. So these are quite big entities. So before that mandatory requirement to have a audit committee comes in at a lower level than that or a smaller business than that, they can still have non-executive directors, even if there's no regulatory requirement. However, any director, whether they're executive or, or non-executive, must comply with the Companies Act. 
regarding their fiduciary duties. Remembering, and I'll go back and reflect on this, the public interest score of a company, if it is more than 350, then that company must have um, produced financial statements which need to be audited. It is at that point that it is recommended that even if they are um, being audited and they are not required to have an audit committee, um, that they have some degree of independent oversight. If it's a company with less than 350 and they're not required to have their financials audited, then King still recommends that there is that, that independent oversight. Once a company is required to have an audit committee because it has now become a public company or it has um, it's a state-owned company, those, those audit committee members must be independent and that audit committee must have three. I just want to reiterate at this point that that threshold of the public interest score of 350 deals with the requirement to have audited annual financial statements. That is not the threshold at which a company must have an audit committee. The requirement to have an audit committee is limited to public companies, state-owned companies, and then private companies where the MOI says they must have an audit committee. Where the 350 is important is once those annual financial statements are being audited, it is really a good idea, very important then, to have some independent oversight, sort of a mini audit committee that might have a look at those financial reports and add some credence or credibility uh, to them. The downside of non-executive directors is that they are entitled to charge fees, so they could create an additional cost. And they might be quite hard to recruit for small businesses, particularly if they're looking for expert skills. Small businesses might be able to use professional advisors instead. They may not be non-executive directors, but they may still be able to assist the company in resolving issues, particularly if they um, were dispute related. They can still add a great deal of value to businesses. King 4, in its supplementary reports, has a, has a separate report, a segmental report, just for small businesses, and it's called the SME segment. And this is where King Committee really talks about proportionality. So the 16 principles in King 4 must be applied by a business. However, how the business goes about doing that and applying that is a lot more flexible the smaller the business comes. And that's because recognition needs to be given to the fact that all companies need to have good governance. If the past six or seven slides have not made it clear already, it's very important for businesses to have good corporate governance regardless of their size. But the, the ability of those companies to incorporate those very strict rules or um, complex facilities that, that King 3 envisaged um, in, in those 76 principles that it had make, made it very difficult for businesses to, to apply those principles. So now in King 4 we talk about applying those principles and then supporting them with recommended practices that suit the size and the, the, of the business and its resources and the degree of complexity of the business. They, they basically need to, these recommended practices in King should be scaled proportionally. So a finance team and where King talks about a finance team, that could reference only a senior manager rather than an entire committee um, or a committee function that might have been performed by an audit committee can now be de delegated simply to a single board member who has a degree of independence. It's important though to um, keep those necessary policies and structures in place because that governance structure can avoid all those aspects of poor corporate governance that we discussed earlier on. It's important to ensure that those delegated responsibilities, that implementation component, is still carried out. Let's have a look at some of the good corporate governance contributions 
that can be made to an SME and, and, and what those results might be. So good corporate governance in an SME will add credibility and enhance the reputation. They will be more trustworthy for external stakeholders to deal with. Good corporate governance will allow a small business to have access to capital and loans on better terms. So they may be able to get funding from the bank rather than rely on a personal loan that they would have got in their personal capacity at a high interest rate. They may be able to employ more talented people and retain those skills in the business. They may be able to improve access to customers and to markets. They may be better positioned to capture business opportunities that come along and they will be better positioned to prevent any fraud that might happen or even errors in their financial controls. Their business continuity, their ability to withstand shocks and volatility and to recover from those shocks will be stronger. So my bet is that those companies with good corporate governance will do better under the COVID environment than those businesses that had poor corporate governance. They will also have leadership continuity through succession planning. So even if it's a small business or a partnership or even to some extent a sole proprietorship, you can still put in place succession planning that makes sure that you take that key person risk out of the factors and even if one person leaves, that business still remains successful. And then in a, con in a business, a family business, you can have better tools to manage conflict, which inevitably does arise. At the bottom of the slide, I've referenced a very interesting study that was done um, in Thunder Bale Park, of all places, um, and it dealt with 152 SMEs. Now, at this point, I'd normally make a joke to say I didn't think that there were 152 SMEs in Thunder Bale Park, but that might just illustrate to you how many SMEs there actually are functioning in the South African environment. And what the study found was that in these SMEs that had implemented good corporate governance, they had significantly and positively improved their competitiveness and their performance. So if you want to go and have a look at that article, the reference is there and it is quite interesting to see there is evidence that good corporate governance will support value creation in your business. Let's look specifically at governance in family-owned companies. There are many family-owned companies around the world and most of the, these businesses or many of the successful businesses that we know have some component of a family business history. So Nintendo was a family business to start with. Lego remains a family business and probably the foremost business in people's minds when we think about family businesses that have a global, global reach. In most economies, family-owned businesses actually make up a substantial portion of that economic wealth creation. So if you, think, if, you, if you realize how big the SME market is and how much of a contribution that makes to our economy, and then you consider that most SMEs have a family base, you can really get a view, a bird's eye view of how many companies in South Africa might be family-owned. Wholly owned, fam owned by families, um, they, so I beg your pardon, so businesses wholly owned by families or which have a high degree of family ownership, um, very common, but often not very transparent in how they report externally to stakeholders because that shareholder, director, manager relationship is not only in one or two people, it's actually now in a small family group. And there's often a low degree of accountability. So you have shareholders who are brothers and sisters and somebody does something wrong in their capacity as a, as a manager and it doesn't, they can't break the family dynamic. So they don't hold that person accountable in any way. That might be detrimental to the family business structure, 
but it can be very, very detrimental if there are any external shareholders, any minority shareholders who might have bought into the structure. So um, it can be a very big risk. As a result of the perception of low levels of governance in family-owned businesses, they often have a lower market value than non-family-owned businesses. Markets in a larger environment tend to react quite negatively to the appointment of a family member as an heir to the company. So where an executive of a large company resigns and he appoints his son as his successor, markets tend to be quite skeptical of that because the person who is ultimately the executive needs to be the right person for the job, suitably skilled and experienced, and they family membership should not be the criteria. Family-owned companies have this additional layer of relationships which adds complexity to the governance. So shareholders who are also directors and then they employ their children and then you have children reporting into parents and brothers and sisters reporting into each other. It creates challenges in... Um, attracting external management and other skills to come in. Markets are beginning to replace an increasing amount of value on corporate governance in family-owned companies in order to address these challenges, particularly separate shareholder and management responsibilities and interests to deal with those potential conflicts of interest. Defined managerial roles, so one may be the CFO, one may be the CEO, and while they act in those capacities, they must be given that authority and held accountable as anyone would, regardless of the fact that they might be family members. There should be an improvement in transparency of reporting. So we're not only going to be held accountable to our own family members, but we're gonna be held accountable to all our stakeholders. And where you have minority shareholders in this environment, there should be specific protections built in for them. Family businesses, though, do have some considerable strengths, which speak to the number of, of successful family businesses that there are in the world. They tend to have a longer-term strategic focus, and the controlling shareholders and managers hold that strategic focus for a longer period of time. They don't chop and change their strategy very frequently. There's a lot of alignment between management and shareholder interests, and that can have um, a very positive impact on strengthening the balance sheet and that core asset value. And there's a focus on core activities. They understand their business very well, and they do it with a large degree of success. So the term stick to your knitting comes to mind. As we've discussed, family businesses do have challenges. The assets are not necessarily legally separated out from those of the company. The company's assets and the family's assets are not necessarily uh, separated. So you may find that the company owns the bucky, but on the weekends, then the father uses the bucky to go fishing in. Um, which he, strictly speaking, shouldn't be doing because that's a company asset. They tend to have informal governance policies and they place reliance on key people decisions rather than structures and processes. So uh, family-owned businesses tend to have very weak delegations of authority. They would rather check with the brother or check with the son or check with the dad and then whatever that person said would be the thing that was done rather than going through a, a, a proper... Um, structure of authority. There tend to be those uh, weaknesses in internal controls and informal financial reporting. Internal audit is probably very low, if not non-existent. Formal risk management process is probably not in place. And there isn't really an appetite even to develop these things. They tend to trust each other and so the need for these processes is not highlighted. As these companies grow and ownership is passed on from each generation further down, so those governance risks simply expand tenfold as we go down the levels. 
there are specific solutions that can be implemented to improve governance. Separating functions of ownership, control and management are central to good corporate governance in a family business. They must create boundaries between company and family assets and particularly their financial accounts. So the company's account cannot be used by mom to go grocery shopping. That simply cannot happen. Those financial assets must be separated. Where a family business wants to hand down succession to its heirs, that's fine if that's what they want to do, but they must make sure that those heirs have the ability to be responsible owners and can assume the different roles of shareholder, director and employee. You can't simply leave school and just say, well, you know, I'm going to get a job as the CEO in my father's business one day, so that's it. There should be a proper structure to mentor so that when that son or daughter did become the CEO, they were in fact the right person for the job. A lot of this can be assisted through implementing a family constitution, which might be a living document, such as a board charter might be, something along those lines. A living document which evolves with the family and as the company grows and can be updated regularly to address the changing needs of the family and the company. It would clearly define the vision, the mission statement and the core values of the business as you would find in any other business. It may define a board of directors that is required to act and that might be a voluntary thing that the company puts in place to ensure the management is is secure and that governance is, is properly, there's a custodian of corporate governance in the board. How the executive management roles will be formed and how they will be filled. That authority, responsibility and the relationship between family, board and senior management. So having a delegation of authority. How conflict situations might be resolved, getting an insight, getting an external a professional advisor to come in whenever there's a conflict, for example, having that independent element on the board would be important. And then make sure that there are policies addressing significant family issues such as employment, transfer of shares, succession planning, who will be the chairman, how long will they be the chairman, how does one become nominated to the board, do you have to be a family member, do you not, can we have outside people, those sort of things so that they are always managed in this formal way. Remember that such a family constitution would be a company policy and a company policy would then become law to the company and the company would have to follow that. There are quite a lot of family owned businesses in South Africa and a lot of them have been impacted by the BE legislation that came in in 2002. So why, does, why BE legislation is particularly important in a family-owned business structure is it challenges the essence of that family business and might counteract the goals of a business with relation to ownership and management control. So if you think about a family business, one of the reasons that a family business may even exist in the beginning is because they want to keep the assets in the family, they want to keep the company in the family, they want to keep control over the family. So when they need to dilute that through BE legislation, so that dynamic of ownership and management control will change. In doing this, in, in adhering to this uh, to BE legislation, which has a very important social impact, these companies must face these challenges with regard to finding the right BEE partner who fits into the business and supports the existing family values and culture. It doesn't help at all to go and get a BEE partner, bring somebody in who's going to sort out your BEE scorecard, you're going to be a level one, everyone's going to be happy, but the two of you don't see eye to eye or you have different visions for the business. That's going to be really hard and it's going to have a significantly negative impact on the sustainability of the business, which doesn't help either shareholder, it doesn't help the goals of BEE to be achieved, and it damages six stakeholders' interest in that sustainability. So aside from simply finding a BEE partner, businesses need to make sure that they find the right BEE partner.
they must have the correct skill set and be affordable and, and, and being affordable to the incoming owner who is um, able to continue to keep this business going. Um, all those underlying factors in choosing the right business partner must still come into play. The impact of, of BEE is that in these family businesses, we now have non-family members making decisions um, and taking over control of day-to-day -day activities that might have been limited to family members before. So there will be a fundamental structural change in the business. Families may not want to lose any of the control or ownership over the business, which can be challenging. And there may be a business imperative um, if there is a potential threat that a large portion of the business is lost if the company is not BEE compliant from an ownership perspective. Some of you may be aware of what the 2013 regulations include and there are um, punitive levels. So if a company doesn't achieve a minimum level of ownership, it will automatically drop a level. And then there's customers who will only do business with suppliers who have a certain level of BEE compliance. So there may be a strong business imperative to bringing in those BEE partners and to giving away that ownership. I've given some examples of family-owned businesses in South Africa. Af African Rainbow Minerals, amongst many other companies, are owned by the Mitsepi family. Fed Group, um, which owns Fed Group, uh, which owns the, the participation bonds and beneficiary schemes, owned by the Field family. Rem Grows, owned infamously by the Ruperts, Johan Rupert. I think he's well known now after his, their substantial donations of himself and the Mutsepis to, to the relief funds. And then I think everybody in South Africa knows the Oppenheimer family, who until a few years ago owned large stakes in Anglo-American and its subsidiary entities. Right, let's have a look at non-profit companies or non-profit organizations. This is the environment that we often refer to as NGOs, non-governmental organizations. That's what King refers to them as, and King has a sector supplement for NGOs as well. What is important to remember about these companies or organizations is that they can make a profit, but that profit cannot be used to be given to shareholders or members. It cannot leave the company or the organization. All the profits that are made by the company or the organization must stay in that company or organization in order to continue the purpose for which it was formed in the first place. So non-profit companies or organizations can be incorporated companies in terms of the Companies Act, and that's when you hear the words non-profit company. Or they can be unincorporated, so no juristic personality, um, and then they are non-profit organizations and they are constituted under the um, there's legislation that deals with them okay generally they have a chari charitable or religious or educational or social some other benevolent or altruistic charitable purpose they do not have the objective of making these profits for the purpose of distributing those profits to shareholders or members so we don't talk about members we talk about, which, apologies, we don't talk about shareholders, we talk about members, but even if they are members in these entities, they do not get the profits. The profits stay in these organizations to be used for furthering the objective of the organization. These organizations still need to have good corporate governance because donor funding will be required. And where donors are giving away money, they're not expecting a return on this, this is a gift. They will only give money to organizations that they can see that their financial statements and financial information is well managed, that that money is going to be used productively to achieve those organizations' objectives. It's not going to line the pockets of somebody. 
um, and, and in that regard, those audited or reviewed financial res reports are very important. There also needs to be evidence of good corporate governance, a clear strategy. Even if it's a charity, it requires a strategy that needs to be properly implemented and then it needs to have sound financial management around that implementation of the strategy in order to deliver its purpose. The stakeholders of an NGO would be typically the community in which the organization operates or the community that it supports. It may have broader stakeholder groups than small businesses, so even if it doesn't have employees in, in, in vast numbers, it will still have employees. Um, communities that it, it impacts would be its customers, and so there may be very many of those. They often rely on volunteers um, and they have codes of conduct, but it could be quite difficult to enforce codes of conduct against a volunteer if you don't comply with the code of conduct. Well, then there's no disciplinary action we can hold like we would with an employee. They may just stop volunteering. They can have independent non-executive directors who join these organizations. Um, on a voluntary basis and contribute that go governance oversight. The challenges that NGOs typically face is difficulty in attracting suitably skilled employees at competitive rates who also have a buy-in for that organization's purpose. So they still need a CEO, they may still need a CFO, and they want and they deserve those people to be suitably skilled for those roles, but they may not be able to afford to pay competitive salaries as one could earn in, in, a, in a commercial environment. They may have relative inertia from non-executives who volunteer, but they don't actually deliver on the strategy. So these non-executives tends to be quite cool to be a director of a charity. You can put it on your CV, but because you're not being paid and because it's just a it's a goodwill organization, non-executives can be a bit lazy and lose sight of what needs to be done. So you can have boards without much influence in strategic delivery. It is very important then for NGOs to, to maintain good corporate governance structures, particularly their financial and legal records. If they have any um, formal registration documents, if they're a trust or a nonprofit company or a registered nonprofit organization, all of those forms need to be completed and up to date and, and kept up to date. All their tax exemption certificates need to be managed properly because donors, when they donate money, can receive a tax exemption for that. There's obviously a great deal of value in having audited financial statements. They may not be required by law to do so, but there is considerable value to donors to make sure that that money is going to be well managed. And there's also a great deal of value in having an integrated report because this is a document they can hand over to donors to show how their value creation model works in exactly the same way that a company would want to show shareholders and investors how it creates value with the money that they invest. Governance in nonprofit companies. Let's have a look at companies, nonprofit companies that have been incorporated under the Companies Act. They are managed under um, Schedule 1 and Section 10 of the Companies Act. They must reflect NPC in their name um, in order to indicate that status of being a non-profit company. They must be established with either a public benefit objective or an objective relating to one or more cultural or social activity, communal or group interest. So you cannot run a commercial business through an NPC. It needs to have this public benefit or some benefit, altruistic, charitable benefit for a larger group of stakeholders. All assets and income that come into this NPC 
must be applied towards achieving the objectives of the NPC. So that can be used to, that money can be used to pay the salary of a CEO who's going to drive the strategy so that it's a, it's a successful NGO and it impacts a lot of people. That's perfectly all right. What it can't do is take those assets and those income and distribute them externally to members or any other party that wasn't in the wasn't for the purpose of achieving those objectives. NPCs can be shareholders in profit companies. So they can take the donor funds that they receive and they can invest that money into other companies exactly like another shareholder might. And then they will receive dividends or a growth in, in, in share price on that investment into that other entity. That's a perfectly acceptable method of growing their income that they have. But they themselves would not have shareholders like a profit company would. They may have members or they may not have members. That's absolutely fine. What's important to remember is that in this environment, these members do not have shares. There is no share capital for them to hold. They are not going to receive distributions in the same way that a statutory company might receive. Any profits, as I've said, remain in that NPC for the purpose of achieving its objective. So why would they have members in the first place then? You may ask a very valid question. They don't have to have members, but they can if they want to. And these members would typically be for the furtherance of its objectives rather than a financial benefit from an investment. So they might have a public persona who would be a member of the NPC and then can encourage support or donations for the NPC. Um, so there, there are members of um, Wits Hospice. Um, it's called Wits Hospice, but it actually doesn't have anything to do with Wits University itself. But the hospice organization, there are other charitable organizations that have members and they become like patrons. Now, under the Companies Act, there must be a minimum of three directors. These are separate now from members. They may be the same people, but they are separate legal roles. And they will still be liable under that Section 75, 76 and 77 of the Companies Act. Still expected to um, behave in the same manner as if it was a commercial enterprise. Still the same fiduciary duties to act in the best interests of that NPC. Directors can be paid for their services, particularly executive directors. You may find that non-executive directors donate their time, but it's entirely reasonable to pay a CEO to further these strategic objectives. It must be a reasonable amount of remuneration. Given that delivery of value and services rendered, it must be a reasonable amount. That rationality in remuneration must still be applied. They can be reimbursed for expenses that they make um, and they incur in achieving the objectives of the NPC. And there must be some bona fides agreement between them. And this is the between that executive, I apologize, between the executive and the NPC. And the reason for that is that when an NPC goes off to donors to get money and they say, yes, you know, you're going to give us 100,000 Rand and we're going to use 50,000 of that to pay our CEO, they're going to want to see that there is actually a proper contract that um, exists between the NPC and that CEO and that CEO has certain objectives they need to deliver. Let's have a look then at non-profit organizations. Non-profit organizations are governed by the Non-Profit Organizations Act. These are not going to fall under the Companies Act. They are not companies. In practice, it doesn't matter whether a, an NGO is going to be an NPO or an NPC. It depends on how they want to organize themselves. They can operate either under the Nonprofit Organization Act or under the Companies Act. Either is fine. In terms of the Nonprofit Organization Act, Act, the definition of an NPO is a trust 
or it can in fact be a company which also operates under the Nonprofit Organization Act, just to confuse you a little bit, or any other association of persons. The important thing though is that it's established for a public purpose, very much like an NPC. There's an altruistic, benevolent purpose that has some community interest. The income and property are also not distributable to members or any office bearers, and except as a reasonable compensation for service. So what that means is where you have a member or you have a uh, CEO who is rendering services to the NPO to discharge its strategy, you can pay them, exactly like with an NPC. NPOs need to be registered as NPOs. They need to have a financial year end. They need to have mandatory provisions, which they put into a constitution, very similar to an MOI. They need to maintain accounting records. They have reporting requirements that they need to um, report to various um, state departments. And when they need to be wound up or deregistered, there are specific rules around how that is done. Registration of an NPO under the NPO Act is voluntary. So you can run an NPO but not register it. The implication with that is that you will never be able to receive any state funding. So part of the purpose of having an NPO is so that you can access that state funding. If you're going to be an NPO that wants state funding, which stands to reason that you would want that, then you will have to register under the Act and you would have to then fulfill all of those requirements. Continuing with nonprofit organizations, the Department of Social Justice developed codes of good practice for South African nonprofit organizations, which have been developed to encourage and support NPOs in their contribution to the country, and particularly given the social and economic challenges that we have in our country and that diversity and inequality that many of our community members live with, to try and fill that gap that government can't fulfill on its own. And hence that term, that catch-all term of non-governmental organizations, the idea being that they would fulfill the, the, the functions of government to a certain extent. They would deliver some of those benefits that government's supposed to deliver, but government can't, so they assist government. And in 1994, after the first elections, we had an influx of international investment into these NGOs. And um, with that in mind, there was a lot more need to structure how they were managed, hence this codes of good practice that were developed by the Department of Social Justice. The idea being that they want to create an environment in which NPOs can be productive and effective, and to become effective partners with government and the private sector, that NPOs accept responsibilities for maintaining high standards of practice. It also has recommendations in respect of leadership and management, how fundraising is done, and how resource mobilization, and the roles and responsibilities of donors and sponsors. So all those stakeholders that would have a, have a role in an NPO, fundraisers, donors, sponsors, um, resources that volunteers. So this codes of good practice tries to regulate all of that or give some guidance to how that operates. There's a list of operating principles um, that NPOs should adhere to. And it goes on to say that NPOs should have a governing body, which is like a board, which has a duty of loyalty, care and obedience as to how it conducts its activities. So very much again that idea that there should be a board um, and that that board should act in the best interests of the NPO. Members of governing bodies should serve for an interval of two to four years is an example of one of those um, recommendations that these codes have, whether or not that is practical or aligns with um, a useful governance practice is debatable, but it's an example of what is included in those codes. Typically, NGOs have struggled financially. They've had weak internal controls and they've had limitations from these official frameworks. 
they operate in a fragmented and poorly coordinated environment and they haven't been able to contribute very much to the development of South African society. Certainly from 1994 onwards, they haven't played as big a role as they could. There are certain organizations that have played significant roles, but I'm sure you'll agree that given the challenges that we have in South Africa, there is a lot more ability and need for these organizations to be well run and well governed and to contribute in a more meaningful way to, to South African society. Our last slide for this lesson, and this just gives us a little illustration of that proportionality principle of King, of applying those principles and recommendations into a smaller business and NGO type environment. So what I've done is I've just picked five instances that revolve around King for recommendations and then how that proportional application might look like to a smaller entity. So where King says there should be the formation of a nomination committee. What a smaller organization might do is develop criteria and processes for nominating, electing and appointing new directors. And they could put that into their board charter rather than forming an entire nomination committee. On to the second one. King says non-executive directors should be rotated on a regular basis, so three years to ensure that ob objectivity is remained. And, and what this means is not that we get rid of them after three years and they go away and we never see them again and we have to find new people. What they mean is that every three years the non-executive directors stand for election at the AGM and then if shareholders don't like them they can have that option to vote them out. So when we try and apply that in a smaller company environment, what we could say is rotation is done uh, less frequently given that it's very hard to find skilled non-executive directors for an SME. So we might do it on a five-year basis, um, taking care that we protect this institutional knowledge of the business because we also can't lose these people too quickly. Looking at our third example, King says that the delegation of board responsibilities to board committees should take place. So if you have a smaller company, you may just have a board and it may just be three or four people. It may not have enough people on it to constitute board committees. So what we could say is that matters that were otherwise going to be delegated to a committee could be de delegated to a specific individual to research and then report back with recommendations. So remuneration, instead of having a remuneration committee, one of your independents on your board of two to three, two, three to four people, you could task them with doing some research on, on remuneration in the industry and best practices and, and allow them to provide that guidance to the board. King also says that there should be the appointment of a company secretary or a corporate governance professional. As you know, some companies have to appoint a company secretary. But where a company does not require to have a company secretary, then there should be somebody who thinks about corporate governance. So in a smaller environment, this mini board could in, should ensure that there is some responsibility for board functioning, which is delegated to a responsible person in the company, and that the board obtains professional and independent advice on corporate governance and its legal obligations. This can be outsourced or done on a part-time basis. There may be an in-house lawyer who can also be the company secretary and fulfill that governance advisory role. As long as there is somebody who is spending part of their day thinking about good corporate governance. And then on stakeholder engagement, we don't need to blow the lights out, but in a smaller company, we should be considering and identifying who our stakeholders are and what their interests are in the company. So we could establish formal forums for stakeholder engagements. We could simply have on our website some information and opportunity for stakeholders to feedback. At least have some process in place to identify stakeholders. So that is our 
content for our discussion on corporate governance in private businesses. And I will speak to you again next week. Stay safe, everyone.